Hello and welcome back. So what I want to talk to you about in today's episode is decoupling capacitors. What's their function in a circuit and why usually there's always a group of them. So very rarely in modern electronics you will find a single decoupling capacitor. Usually there's a bunch of them. Let's look at some pictures to show you what I'm on about. So what we have here is a picture of an electronic circuit board where we see power supply, I mean there's two of them here, we have another power supply here. Now we can see that capacitors, the decoupling capacitors, come in a nice group. So you have a small capacitor, a bigger one, and then even bigger one. So they're all in parallel. And this is clearly visible because you can see the traces linking them together. And it's the same situation up here. We have small ceramic capacitors, then a tantalum electrolytic one. If we look at a different circuit, for example, here we see the supply for a quartz oscillator. Again, we see four different capacitors all lined up in a row. And just as the last picture, another power supply. I mean, there's a ton of power supplies here. And again, you can see that there's groups of capacitors. So I think all three of these are the same value. And then there's a smaller one and so on. Now, these pictures are very nice. I didn't make them myself, unfortunately. I got them from Dave Jones's Flickr page, so I'll be leaving links to all of these pictures in the description. And you may know Dave Jones as EEV blog, and he has a very nice Flickr page which, with a ton of pictures from electronic teardown, so I highly recommend these. These are some very good quality pictures, so both from a resolution point of view and also from a photography point of view. And they're not artistic pictures, they're electronics pictures, so you can clearly see what's on the board, how the components are linked up, and so on. And there's a very wide variety going from modern electronics to very old electronics, and there's like 50 pages. Now there are some personal pictures in here, but most of them are electronics related, so go check them out, these are some really good pictures. Now coming back to the capacitors, the decoupling capacitor has two main functions in a circuit. First of all, it's an energy storage device, so if your circuit needs a lot of energy on short notice, it will be taking it from the capacitor. And secondly, it's a noise filtration device. Now today I will be focusing on the energy storage part. So if you're curious, then keep watching. So whenever you're trying to supply a circuit, Usually your circuit will be here and then your supply will be here, so a battery or something, and in between you will have some wires. And any wire in the real world has both resistance and inductance. So let's look at some simulations for a moment. What I got here is a 10 volt supply, some wire simulated as a 500 milliohm resistor and a 2 micro Henry inductance. This is roughly 100 centimeters of wiring, and then a 1 amp load. Now if we run this circuit, we see that we have our 10 volt supply, and on the other side we have 9.5 volts. So this is the voltage drop caused by the resistance of the wire and the current passing through it. So with static loads, you only care about the resistance of the wire. You get thicker wires, lower resistance, and more voltage, so everybody's happy. Now if we look at the pulsed load, so, for example, a switching supply or a microcontroller or any sort of circuit that doesn't require constant load, but rather the load varies in time, so between various values, and we use the same setup, so again we start with our 10 volt supply, and we apply a 1 amp pulse, we see that the voltage on the load side this time looks completely different. So, in the end we end up with the 9.5 volts, caused by the resistance, but before that we have a massive voltage drop, so the voltage goes down to zero. Now, for most circuits, this is completely unacceptable, so if your voltage go goes down so low, then something bad will happen, like your microprocessor will restart or, or your circuit will malfunction in some way or another. Now, the main problem behind this is that the inductance of the wire is opposing the flow of current and the longer the wires are, the more inductance, so the more opposition you will have. 
So to fix this, you add a capacitor, a local source of energy very close to your load. So what I got here is the exact same circuit, but this time I added 100 nanofarads. And if we look at this, well, it's not very nice, but at least you don't drop to zero volts anymore. The voltage only drops to about five and a half volts. And then you got a nice oscillation caused by the capacitor and the inductor. So to make things work a bit better, you can try to increase the capacitance. So this time I added a 10 microfarad capacitor. And by doing this, you only have a limited voltage drop. So you still have a little bit of undershoot. It goes down to 9.4 or something. And then the voltage recovers and stabilizes at 9.5. So we can see that by increasing the capacitance, the circuit's response will be better and better. So the voltage drop on the load will be contained. So let's try one more circuit, same load, same wiring, but a hundred microfarads of capacitance. So more capacitance is better, right? Well, if we look at this, we have no more undershoot. The voltage on the load slowly decreases because of the voltage drop on the wiring resistance and there's no more drama. So if you add a hundred microfarad capacitor, then everything will be fine. Or will it? See, the thing is, the real life 100 microfarad capacitor doesn't just have 100 microfarads. It has a bit of parasitics in there. Now, I did a complete video on this, so go check that out. I will leave a link in the description. But for today, I will just use the simplified parasitic model in which you have a capacitor and resistor and an inductor. So something like this. So what I got here is a real life electrolytic capacitor, 100 microfarad capacitor, and it's various parasitics based on the models that I found online. Now, if we try out this circuit, so we try to filter the pulse with the real life capacitor, then we see a slightly different behavior. So it's not as nice as the ideal 100 microfarad capacitor. We still have this massive drop. So the voltage on the load drops to six point something volts and then it slowly stabilizes back to 9.5. And the problem that we're having here is that the real life capacitor has parasitics and the parasitic element that is causing us the most trouble is again the inductance. So the capacitor has an equivalent series inductance, which for electrolytic capacitors, especially those leaded larger electrolytic ones is quite large. So if you want a capacitor with less inductance, usually you will use a ceramic capacitor. So a smaller capacitor, which will have less inductance. So what I got here, again, the same circuit, but this time I use the parameters for a 10 microfarad ceramic capacitor. And this time we can see that our inductance has gone down quite a lot. So with the electrolytic one, we had three nano Henry. Now we have 750 pico Henry. And if we look at this, we have a much, much nicer behavior. So our initial spike is much smaller, but now we got the undershoot back. So we sort of fixed one part of the problem and sort of made the other one worse. And if we look at an even smaller capacitor, so this is a 100 nanofarad 0603 case size, which has even less inductance, here we got our oscillations back, but our initial spike is almost non-existent. So by lowering the inductance, we seem to be fixing our initial spike problem, but by lowering the capacitance, we seem to be losing the voltage on the long run. So now if we try one more thing and take the best of both worlds. So what I got here is the 100 microfarad electrolytic and the 100 nanofarad ceramic capacitor. And we look at the response of this circuit, we see that we solved our problem. We have a very small initial spike and then the voltage drops down to 9.5 volts. So we have our small capacitor with small inductance to provide energy on short notice to attenuate the initial spike. And then we have the large capacitor with more inductance, unfortunately, to provide energy in the long run. So this explains how you can use two decoupling capacitors to supply your circuit. Let's try this out in real life. See just how well this works. 
And for that, I built this little circuit right here. So what I got is a signal coming from the signal generator. So this is a simple square wave driving a transistor, which has a load in the collector, so a 10 ohm load. And then I'm measuring the supply using my oscilloscope probe using a low noise connection. And that's what we're seeing right here. So we can see that the voltage is dropping from 10 volts quite steeply down to almost zero and then slowly re recovering. And now the slope is quite steep and you can see that by the time division, which is 40 nanoseconds per division. So if we zoom in a bit, we can see that there is quite a steep slope. So this is at four nanoseconds per division. So if we look quickly at the schematic, this is exactly what I've built. I got my 10 volt supply, my wiring, and then the transistor being driven by the signal generator. So just like we see in real life, we have a very steep slope and then it slowly recovers. So now let's see what happens when we add a capacitor. And for that, first I'll be adding this 100 microfarad electrolytic capacitor. So now I added it, but it seems that we no longer have any sort of problems. But let's zoom in a bit. So now I went to AC coupling, 100 millivolts per division. And we can see that while most of the spike has disappeared, so it's no longer dropping down to zero, we still have a few 100 millivolts of drop. And this is at a very steep slope. So right now we're still at 20 nanoseconds per division, and that's how long it takes for this signal to draw. So this is the kind of signal that the electrolytic capacitor cannot filter because of its inductance. So now let's also add the 100 nanofarad ceramic capacitor. So I'll be putting this on the rear side as close as possible to the measurement point. And even without soldering it in, just by connecting it to the terminals, we can see that we go from this very steep, very large drop down to a much more manageable signal. So we still have certain voltage drop, but the slope is not that steep anymore. So this is where the ceramic capacitor is really showing its benefits. It's able to provide energy much faster to the circuit because of its lower inductance. Now, speaking about inductance, we've seen that with electrolytic capacitors, you get a lot of capacitance, but you also get a lot of inductance and a lot of series resistance. Now, moving to ceramic capacitors, you get improvements on both of these sides. And talking about ceramic capacitors, a major benefit is going from through hole components to SMD because the terminals become much shorter, so you no longer have the long lead wires. And speaking about the construction of the terminal, you can get even less inductance with SMD components, like with this one. So what I got here, is a type of capacitor that, well, it looks like any other ceramic capacitor other than the way that its terminals are placed. So with a normal ceramic capacitor, an SMD type of capacitor, you have your component and then on the sides, on the small sides, you have the terminals. With this sort of capacitor, they call, TDK calls this a reverse geometry, but it can be found under different names at different manufacturers. Rather than having the terminals on the short side, they put the terminals on the long side. So you can see that the terminals are on the width rather than on the length. And the logic behind this is that the inductance in a capacitor comes from the internal electrodes and their length. So with the terminals connected on the length of the capacitor, you have the very long electrodes in the middle, which have their inductance because of their length. Now, if you take the same capsule, turn it on its side, you have the same electrodes, but now you only see a much shorter current path through them. So they're wider and they're shorter. This means that their inductance will be much lower. And for the standard 1206 capacitor, we had around one microfarad and 750 picohenry of inductance. Whereas for this sort of capacitor, we have only a hundred picohenry of inductance. So much, much lower. Now you can go one step further. And you can get an even lower inductance by using eight terminal or 10 terminal capacitors. Now, these look like a generic capacitor network, but it's a single capacitor with eight pins. And now all of the pins are 
a decently placed. So you have your first pin, second pin, first pin, second pin and so on. And now the reason why this would have an even lower inductance is because as you have your decent pins with current going in different directions, the field around the two conductors will cancel each other out, therefore reducing their inductance. So basically the array of pins works like a common mode choke. Now these two types of capacitors are quite expensive so you won't find these very often, but there is a certain place in which they do seem to be quite often. And that is on microprocessors. So you have your silicon chip here and then you have these reverse geometry capacitors and also these eight terminal capacitors. So these are quite expensive types of technology but when you actually need them you can have them so you can actually use these. And all in all that's about all for today on decoupling capacitors and their energy storage properties. So you need as much capacitance as possible with as little inductance as possible. And next time I will be looking at how you can use these capacitors as filters, so how to enhance their filtering properties. But for now, hope you got some useful information out of this, leave your thoughts in the comments, thank you for watching, make sure to subscribe to be up to date with all my latest videos, and see you next time, bye bye!